Well, I hope your Christmas celebrations were good ones. I hope that you enjoyed your family being here and enjoyed uh, all the wonderful things that come with Christmas. If um, Pastor Aaron is just back, I have a picture of Pastor Aaron at Christmas. Um, that's Pastor Aaron and my father-in-law's dog, Susie. And if you look very carefully, you can see they have the exact same expression. <laughs> They're both contemplating how wonderful it is to celebrate Christmas together, to enjoy a meal, and they both look very well fed. <laughs> now, Pastor Aaron is very well fed on behalf of, or gets a lot of really great food from you folks. As you support him, you tend to give him food. And I want you to know that Aaron takes every bit of that food and savors it and puts much of it in the refrigerator at home so that he can save it to enjoy. And there's nothing wrong with that. Keep sending him the food. He loves it. He enjoys it. He needs it. But that has one unusual side effect. Because Aaron is adding food to our refrigerator at home, other food tends to get crammed back into the very back of the refrigerator. And on Sunday... Sarah said, I've got to have more room in this refrigerator. We've got to clean out some of this stuff in the back. And I was happy to do the chore of washing all those containers. And it reminded me of a story told by noted social commentator George Carlin. He was referencing food found in the back of the refrigerator in containers. And he says, you sometimes get that container out and you open it up and it's this black, gelatinous, gray-green, foul-smelling stuff that you can't really recognize. It could be meat. It could be cake. Maybe it's a new kind of food, meat cake. <laughs> Leftovers, George Carlin said, and I have a picture of one example of stuff that was pushed back into the back of our refrigerator. It's coming up. George Carlin said, leftovers make you feel twice as smart. Some mysterious stuff there. Turns out that's broccoli. <laughs> leftovers like this make you feel twice as smart. First, when you're saving it, you think, I'm really being smart by saving money, by saving broccoli. The second time you feel twice as smart is, I'm saving my life by throwing this away. <laughs> and that is something God built into you. That sense that when you get food like this, no matter how much you want to save money, you throw this out because this is disgusting. Disgust is placed in each of us to save us from things like food poisoning and bad spoiled food. That saves your life by having in your brain an automated circuit that says, I am not going to eat this. That's disgusting. We have another circuit in our brain that warns us about danger. A story uh, in my life that exemplified this was in 2000, we were hiking the Vivian Creek Trail, coming down on a beautiful Sabbath afternoon. I was in the lead, Michael and Tim were there, Sarah was there, and I was happily talking to them over the shoulder, and all of a sudden I performed a feat of athletic um, prowess, thank you, that uh, I could never have replicated. It was my personal best standing broad jump of five feet backwards. And when I landed, I realized my heart was thumping. I was breathing fast. And I realized the reason why I did this was there was a snake going right across the trail where I was about to put my foot. I did not realize that snake was there until after I landed. And when I landed, it occurred to me isn't it wonderful that God has built into my brain and yours the ability to avoid dangerous things without having to go through the bother of thinking, oh, that's a snake. It could be poisonous. Is it a diamond-shaped snake? Does it have slit-like pupils? Well, okay, you don't have to do that. Your brain automatically keeps you out of trouble. So distrust of snakes and disgust of 
bad food are two ways that our brain can automatically, without us thinking about it, without our conscious thought coming into this, protect us. So these things are there to help us identify very quickly what we can trust and what we can't. And I would like to suggest that for the vast majority of human beings, snakes are not something that we trust. I can prove that to you because no matter how much you like snakes, if you found a rattlesnake dying on the side of the road, your first impulse would not be, I need to give this snake mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. <laughs> In our brains, snakes are classified as dangerous strangers, not friendly neighbors even though they might live in the same area. And each of us also have disgust and distrust of people. It's inevitable that there's certain things and certain people that we take as our own, way in the back of our brain, and people that we say are not our own. This is not an issue of race. This is an issue of being human. And because it's an issue of being human, you and I have it, and the people in Jesus' day had it, and Peter and John and Matthew and all of Jesus' earliest followers had the same thing going on behind their consciousness. This happened to me when I was in college. The year was about 1977. I was walking at Washington Adventist University between the girls' dorm and the tennis courts, and it was a bright, sunny spring day. I wasn't thinking of anything until I saw a couple who I knew, but I didn't realize they knew each other. Doug was somebody I'd gone to high school with. Cece was a girl from Ohio who I worked with at the sand kitchen. I had no idea Doug and Cece even knew each other. So it was a little surprising when I saw Doug, who happens to be Caribbean, and Cece, who happens to be Caucasian, not only walking together, but Doug had his arm around Cece's neck like that. And my brain said to me, Doug should not be messing with our women. And a split second later, my brain said, where on earth did that thought come from? And a split second later, the rest of my brain said, that's the stupidest thing you ever heard, that you've ever thought. And it was, because as you might have noticed, I'm not Caucasian. But clearly, somewhere back in my subconscious, I had this idea that Cece was somehow connected to me in a way Doug wasn't. The early church did not have trouble with that. That's an issue that we, growing up in the United States, tend to do. We tend to classify people based on race. But the early church definitely had issues with things that they understood of people are safe, People are not safe. People are neighbors. People are not my neighbors. And we can explore a little bit of what the early church followers of Jesus had in their subconscious by looking at 2 Kings 17 and on. Now, you don't have to read this all. You can go home and read it at your leisure. But this is what people had taught to them. Now, the writer of 2 Kings is trying to explain why God allowed Samaria to be overrun by its enemies, the Assyrians. And so it starts off in verse 18 by saying, the reason why God abandoned Israel was because Israel was morally degenerate. They violated the second commandment by creating idols. Number two, the writer says, the reason why God did not stand up for Samaria was because what they had done at the beginning of Samaria was illegal. They overthrew the rightful king, Rehoboam, and substituted an illegal person, Jeroboam. But then it's very slick. As you read 2 Kings 15, the writer, 17, I'm sorry, 17, the writer immediately slips in to saying not only was that true of Israel back before they went into captivity, he says, and also you can't trust those people up north now. This is a totally different group of people. And he says, you can't trust them now 
because they're racially different. These were people settled by the kings of Assyria. They're not like us racially. Number four, you can't trust them because they're not politically the same as us. They're likely to support these foreign kings, not be patriotic citizens like us. Number five, these people can't be trusted because they're culturally different. And you'll see right there in verse 34, these people brought their foreign customs to Samaria. As a matter of fact, they are practicing them right now today. If you go into one of their houses, you might find an idol hidden away somewhere in the back. Don't trust them. If that's not bad enough, reading Ezra and Nehemiah confirm that you can't trust Samaritans. Ezra, who was a scribe, said, these people can have no part in helping us build the temple. They are different from us. They worship differently from us. We can't trust them. And Nehemiah, who founded a group that was very interested in keeping Jews separate. Anybody know the name of that group that was very interested in Jesus' time of being separate from the world? Pharisees. Nehemiah said, you can't socialize with them. If they marry you, we aren't going to have that. We're going to break up the marriages and send all these Samaritan women back. So Samaritans were untrustworthy because they're morally degenerate, they're illegal, they're racially different, politically different, culturally different, religiously different, and this is settled fact by the time of Jesus' day. So every pious Jew, including Peter and John and Matthew and all of Jesus' earlier followers, knew that Samaritans were not neighbors, they were dangerous strangers. They knew that consciously, but they also knew it unconsciously, buried deep in the brain. Now, this is a problem because Samaritans, of all the people in the world, were the only people who kept kosher besides the Jews because Samaritans followed a great teacher, Moses. They kept the Sabbath, they paid tithe, they offered sacrifices according to the law of Moses, and yet these people were not trustworthy. And the rest of the world, well, they were not only not trustworthy, but they were also disgusting Gentiles who did all those things, like eat non-kosher foods. And so it's interesting that at the start of his ministry, when Jesus is ready to send out the first 12 missionaries, he says to them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles. This is found in Matthew 10, 5 and 6. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost house of Israel. Have you ever heard of a missionary command that says, don't go preach the gospel? But essentially, that's what Jesus did to the very first missionaries. And I'd like to explore why Jesus might have said that and what did Jesus do while he was present with us to change these unconscious and conscious thoughts of the early church? What did he do? Well, I'd like to suggest one thing that he did for both Samaritans and Gentiles is that he consciously tried to get his earliest followers to visit and talk to Samaritans and Gentiles. He constantly is traveling through Samaria and to Gentile regions like Decapolis and Syrophoenicia, places where Jews would not normally go. And he not only traveled through those countries, he kept talking to people who were Jews and Gentiles. And you can think of times when Jesus did that. Did John and Matthew and Peter recognized what Jesus was doing. As they wrote their gospels and preached, they kept saying, you know, it's funny, but Jesus took us through Samaria. He talked to that Samaritan woman. He talked to those Greek people that came over with Andrew, or with Philip. He kept doing this over and over again, and the earliest followers of Jesus recognized Jesus was doing something that most Jews didn't. So the first thing he did was increase contact. The second thing he did was every time a Samaritan 
or a Gentile did something unusual that would be against the stereotypes held by Peter and Matthew and John, he pointed it out. And I didn't realize this, but this actually has a psychological term called counter-stereotype exposure. And you can remember times when Jesus said, did you see that Samaritan? He's the only one who came back and said, thank you. I've never seen faith like this in a person of Israel, but here's this Roman centurion who's expressing this. And did his earliest followers remember that? As they wrote their gospels, they kept pointing out. Jesus kept calling out these different people who surprised us by actually being followers of Jesus, by responding to his message. So those are two things that he did to help prepare the church. But the third thing he had to do, and this is regarding to Samaritans, is he had to call out to bring to the earliest followers to their conscious attention the way they thought. And I'd like to suggest that he did that through a parable that all of you recognize as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, nowhere in that parable is it say Good Samaritan. It's just a parable. It's just a story. But this is so different than what you expect. So keep in mind that if we were a good Jew in Jesus' day, we would understand that it was a settled fact that Samaritans were not neighbors. And yet Jesus, in this circumstance, is going to change the way we think about it. So he starts off in Luke, in Luke 10, 25, with a scribe or a lawyer t- testing him. It says, just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. A lawyer or a scribe is in the same profession as Ezra, the man who said, Samaritans cannot help us build the temple because they are not like us. In all likelihood, this lawyer or scribe was a Pharisee, a follower of Nehemiah who said, don't have any social contact with Samaritans. And so the lawyer stands up to test Jesus and says, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said to him, like any good Jewish rabbi, what do you think? How do you read it? The lawyer quotes Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says that's the right answer, do that and live. And then the scribe says, and who is my neighbor? So for this scribe, for this Pharisee, the question is settled. Samaritans are not our neighbor. The question really was, are only righteous Pharisees our neighbor, the people who are really strict about things? Or could we also be neighborly to more lax Jews? But Samaritans were off the table. We know that from Second Kings. We know that from Ezra. We know that from Nehemiah. And it's in that context that Jesus tells a story. And we all know the story. A man was going down the road to Jericho and fell in with uh, thieves who beat him and left him half dead. And by chance, a priest comes by, walks on the other side of the road because you don't want to touch anything unpure that would make you not possible to go and do your duty at the temple. Second person comes by, a Levite, walks by on the other side. And if Jesus wanted to answer the scribe's question, the third traveler should have been the good Pharisee, right? Because a good Pharisee would say, this person is a Gentile or a Samaritan, but I, as a good Pharisee, know that I should minister to them, and so I will go and help this person out. That would have answered the the scribe's question, and it would have blown his listeners' minds to think that Samaritans or Gentiles were included. But it's interesting that Jesus does not tell the parable of the good Pharisee. He is implying to the scribe who is asking him the question, your very question is wrong. This is not an issue of building a fence around the good people and putting all the neighbors inside. Think about it from the snake's perspective. Think about it from somebody that you would not consider a neighbor. 
And so you know what the story is. Instead of the good Pharisee, a Samaritan comes traveling by, sees the man, and keep in mind that Samaritans had just as much animosity toward Jews as Jews toward uh, Samaritans, and they had just as much reasons for distrusting Jews as Jews did of Samaritans. He comes by, he was moved with pity, he takes care of him, he puts him up at the finest inn possible, he pays for his health care, and in the end, Jesus asks the scribe, who was the neighbor? Who, was, who do you think was the neighbor to the man? And of course, the scribe can't say, what well, was that Samaritan? It was the one who showed him mercy. Jesus was trying to tell the good Seventh-day Adventists of the first century, his friends, his colleagues, you are thinking of the question of neighbor wrong. You need to think that the answer to the question is neighbors are all people. Now, the, so Jesus has taken the time to introduce his earliest followers to people that they would not have normally dealt with. He has taken the time to do counter stereotype exposure to them to point out these people are not the people you, you think they are, that you, th you have subconsciously thought they are. These are people you can deal with. And he finally asks his followers, think about how you are thinking. Use metacognition. Think about the way you think of these things. Did this work? Did Jesus' ministry, his presence with his disciples, did it change their minds? I'd like to suggest to you that Acts 8 strongly suggests Jesus' um, efforts worked. Because in Acts 8, the first missionary goes to Samaria, the Samaritans are converted, and they're welcomed into the church. It is not a big issue as far as Samaritans go. But you notice there is no parable of the good Gentile. Jesus does the same things as far as taking them to Gentiles territory, talking with Gentiles, praising Gentiles, but he does not ask his earliest followers to think about their thinking about Gentiles until after he has died, after he has been resurrected, after the Holy Spirit has been poured out on Peter and the others, after 3,000 people were converted at Pentecost, he does not take that last step until the messengers from Cornelius are probably within blocks of Peter lying on the roof waiting for supper or lunch. God isn't interested in abstract perfection, but God is very loving to people like Peter, to you, to me, to prepare us for the missions he sends us just in the nick of time when we need it. This story about Peter and the net, we're gonna talk about in the next series of sermons on the early church. So come back on January 19 when uh, this story will be discussed. Come back next Sabbath when Pastor Aaron will be talking about Acts. But I just wanna show you just a little bit about how effective Jesus' message on these regards are. Because that one dream about the unclean food in the net was repeated by Luke, not once, not twice, but three separate times, and is referred to throughout the rest of the Pauline writings and Acts as the seminal event that allowed Gentiles to become full-fledged Christians. In God's family, God said through that vision, there are no foster children. Anyone who's adopted in as my child is fully a member of the family. There are no first class and second class Christians. So in the end of the book of Luke and at the beginning of Acts, Jesus is telling his early church, his earliest followers, their mission. And in Acts 1 it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria 
and to the ends of the earth. So we're going to talk a little bit about where we have come and where we're going as we have this Sabbath. For the past five Sabbaths, we've been talking about God's presence. And the pastoral staff has been preparing us and talking about what Jesus' presence means to us today. His presence changed everything for the early church. His presence did not end when he ascended, but he continues to be present with us today. Take a look at the end of the book of Matthew. We just said in Matthew 10, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he told his disciples, don't go to the Samaritans, don't go to the Gentiles, stick with where you're comfortable, initially. But by the end of his three and a half years, he is able to say to them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I command you. Remember, I am always with you to the end of the age. So as we stand here at the end of 2018, looking forward to 2019, do you sense that Jesus' presence is still among us? And then as he asks us to go forth and tell other people about him, he is always going to be with us, preparing us for whatever mission he sends us on. And do you believe that as you talk about Jesus and as you live your lives exemplifying what Jesus taught, that other people will sense his name, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and what a wonderful name that is. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for coming to this earth. Thank you for being the kind of God who was present with us, who showed yourself to us, and who still has presence in our midst right now. Thank you for being here and preparing us for the mission on which you send us this week and throughout 2019. Help us to remember yours is a wonderful name. In your name we pray. Amen.